here. Let's see what the magic box has for us today, shall we? Okay, come on, baby. Okay, the question. Whoa, whoa, whoa. I told you it was a magic box. Jeez, looks like this time the magic box has one of the 10 questions it wants me to answer. Hopefully they will be quick. So, get to it here. Okay, <clears throat> so, question number one. I know you've touched on Enochian magic in the past, but I'm curious about what these Enochian entities are exactly from a Bardonian or Ronian cosmological view of the universe. Are these energies human created or do they somehow align with more universal forces? More importantly, are they just distractions or do they fit with a larger context of energies that an initiate inevitably encounters on their path of initiation? Well, from a Ronian perspective, purely Ronian perspective, the uh, in, in whole Enochiana, to me, just sounds like a intellectualized human construct, having no relevance other than the human context. That's a Ronian perspective, okay? I don't think it's worth wasting your time. Okay, question number two. To what extent are the events of our life predetermined or fated? Is it sometimes warranted to exercise our will to manifest external change, or is it wiser to simply accept our condition and focus on modifying a response to unpleasant situations? If changing our circumstance is sometimes acceptable, how can we distinguish between when this is legal versus when it is not? How to distinguish between a situation which can be changed versus one that cannot be changed because of karmic limitations? How to perceive the karmic lessons in complex situation when no lesson is obvious? Why isn't the universe communicating more clearly? Where does EM fit into perception and understanding of karmic lessons? Okay. The first part, to what extent uh, are the events of our life predetermined or fated? Uh, the actual events, I would say, are not fated, not predetermined. What is fated, what is predetermined, is the, the group of karmic life lessons that we need to learn in this incarnation. Okay? Now, those lessons tend to take predictable forms, especially, you know, in the context of an individual life. But that's not predetermined. Our choices, the choices we make, determine events in our life, not predetermined fate, okay? Because fate, it's, it's all in our hands. We can constantly change what is fated, how our karmic lessons manifest, depending on how well we learn them, how, how open to them we are. Now, determining whether something is karmic or not, or what the karmic root is, this just takes time and practice and getting to know yourself and trying to perceive what the karmic roots are of something or what the lesson is in an event, whether or not it's, quote, legal for us to intervene. I mean, the universe lets us know one way or the other by whether or not we are successful in intervening. But, you know, we have to then discern whether it's how we've gone about it that's unsuccessful or the very fact of trying it is fated to be unsuccessful because of karma. 
that's just, there is no trick to it. It's time, it's maturity, it's, you know, increasing one's understanding through living, okay? And trying. That's the thing, there's nothing saying we can't try. Even if the odds are completely stacked against your success, that doesn't mean you can't try. Because you learn something from every failure, probably more from each failure than you learn from every success, okay? So never stop trying. <clears throat> now, it, why isn't the universe communicating more clearly? Well, why aren't you listening? more closely, because the universe is communicating so loudly. I mean, the universe shouts all of its lessons to us, but we're so dense, <laughs> we don't understand the language that the universe is speaking to us in. So the cure there is to just listen more closely, and you'll find that the universe communicates very clearly and very loudly. And this is where EM, essential meaning, can play a big part. If you learn to directly perceive essential meaning and you start perceiving the essential meaning in different things, in different events in your life, whoa, the universe veritably shouts its meaning to you. Okay, question number three. Can you make a video about the concept of differing dimensions? I'm pretty sure that most of us watching have, had, have heard people in the spiritual community talk about lower and higher dimensions or planes of existence, such as the first all the way to the eleventh and sometimes twelfth dimensions. I guess I would be mostly curious about what your take on these dimensions and are, and what they are, and what are, are they like. Blech. I have heard that people whose consciousness is in a lower frequency go to lower dimensions when they pass, while those who possess a consciousness of a higher frequency go to higher dimensions when passing on. Does this mean that there is a so-called underworld? Okay. The whole idea of these differing dimensions in terms of occultism comes from 19th century occultism and its pseudo-scientific justification for arcane teachings. So, we have dimensions of existence, levels of vibration, higher a vibration being good, lower vibration being bad, evil. This is just all bullshit as far as I can see. You know, <clears throat> we all exist in a multi-dimensional uh, space and existence. We all resonate at different frequencies throughout the day. You know, it's and it's just a matter of ego to say, I am at a higher level of vibration than you. Yeah. Blah, blah, blah. It's a very destructive philosophy to be pursuing because it separates people and makes one greater and the other lesser. And the universe is not built that way. It's not a hierarchy. It's a lateral shift from one state of awareness to another, not up and down and up and down. We've got to let go of this hierarchical way of thinking, of approaching the universe, because it is self-destructive. Okay. <clears throat> Question number four. What is Ayin? 
A rabbi told me it is above Kether since God is unknowable. Okay, so, <clears throat> now I, my explanation is completely bereft of Judaism, completely bereft of religion in general, okay? So cosmologically speaking, ayin, the word ayin and the letter ayin, the same thing, means not, nothing, no thing. It also has a few, a couple of other meanings, but here when we speak of the ayin, this is the usage of the word that we are, you know, <clears throat> Focusing on not nothing, no thing. Okay, in the longer the longer phrase that expresses what is beyond Kether is Ayin Sof R, the light with no end, limitless light. It's been translated as, but the Ayin, this. <clears throat> This is something that we cannot conceive of. It's simply impossible for us because we are things. We are part of Kether, of the unity of all things, of everything that exists. The Ayin is a realm outside of that which does not exist, in which there is not existence. And even trying to fit our words around it, every word we have, every word I just use, is predicated on the idea of existence, of things that exist and have being. So it's just something that we cannot conceive of that we can't touch, that is just so foreign to everything that exists. So we call it the Ayin. Now, the only level of awareness that is capable of even sensing what the Ayin is not, or See, our words get in the way. The only level of awareness that is capable of interacting at a conceptual um, level is Kether, is the unity of all that is itself. Only that unity of all that exists has any relationship with I.E. Okay, so it's something that we cannot understand, cannot relate to, and therefore, for me, does not equate to a religious God concept. The two just don't relate, because the Ayin has absolutely nothing to do with the realm of existence. It cannot. So it's a little more complex than the traditional religious dogma. Okay. So, question number five. <clears throat> Barton advises that we do not use the magic mirror to reveal past lives, as this will lead to indifference towards this life and a lack of free will to knowledge of one's karma. This isn't an opinion necessarily shared by those who believe they have past life memories. Could you elaborate in why Bardon by this means by this and tell us whether you agree? Now, I don't think Bardon's wording was quite that definitive. Um, I think it was a little more of a, hey, you do this, you're going to have these consequences, okay? Whether you use the mirror to explore the past life memories or use other means, and the mirror is just one method, okay, 
and by far not the best method in my opinion. Um, but when you look, when you consciously try to reclaim memories of the past, if you succeed, it deeply affects you. And really the ultimate effect is that of humility. Because you come to realize that you've been a, a great age, you know, a million times. You have been a truly awful human being. Several times, probably. We all have within us all the things that we despise in this moment. That's all in here. In looking at your past lives, you have to accept responsibility for everything that you have done. Okay? And you've got to figure out your place in that. And that is, you know, a demanding shift. <clears throat> so, you realize all the ugly things about yourself and all of the beautiful things about yourself at the same time. And you see, you end up seeing yourself with a clarity and an honesty that is mm, a little difficult to achieve uh, in just one single incarnation, okay? Because taking responsibility that deeply is not something we do in our normal incarnation, you know? Because generally we haven't done so much. But when you look at your entire past, that is what you learn about yourself. So, it does affect you. It does affect how you live the rest of your life. It does affect your relationship to your karma because you understand your karma and you see what lessons you need, I mean really need, to learn. Okay? So, it's very clarifying. And that, you know, damn well better have major effects on your psyche. If not, then uh, something's wrong, okay? Okay, question number six. You say that once one completed step ten in initiation into hermetics, and achieved unity with everything in the universe, they will need to undergo an extreme transformation of character, so to speak. So my question is, why is this the case? What does one experience or realize when they achieve unity that causes them to undergo such an intense transformation? Do we have a say in how we decide to change after we reach this point? Personally, I don't like the thought of this because I guess to a degree, I fear be being someone that I didn't, that I don't want to be now in the future. If I complete initiation into hermetics, will I be forced to change? Or is it somewhat like the early stages of character transformation initiation to hermetics, where we change because we need to maintain the astral equipoise? Well, um, I don't believe I said that you will need to go through um, a, an extreme transformation of character. I said that you will <laughs> go through an extreme transformation of character. But that's an internal thing. By this stage, your external character that you manifest to the world is totally a matter of your choice. So the internal transformations you go through 
will or will not be reflected externally in your interactions with other people only to the degree that you want because you are the one who determines your character now why does this happen i mean well just think about it for a moment how transformative it must be to merge your awareness even for a moment with everything that exists. Just think about that for a minute. You don't think that's going to change you? <clears throat> no one can go through that experience without changing. For some people, it's, it just blows them totally apart. Um, you know, they end up crazy afterwards. Literally. Because their mind is just blown. It could not handle what it perceived. But done, you know, in a constructive way, such as initiations or hermetics, that danger is very minimal because you have prepared yourself and you have gone about it intentionally and consciously. Okay, I mean, the person you are now compared to the person you will be when you reach that point of step 10, uh, it's night and day, it's, you know, it's apples and oranges, you know, it's two different things, okay? <clears throat> There's nothing to be afraid of there. Yeah. Okay, question number seven. In TMO, what is the difference between yod heh vav -Hey and Adonai? Is yod heh vav -Hey the creative process? Is Adonai similar to the physical presence of divine, the Shekinah? Why do we use both together? This is a very good question, and I really can't believe that I've never um, explained that before. Okay? So, <clears throat> thank you, Olivier. Um, okay. Yod He Vav He is the unspeakable name of God, right? In the Torah. It's unspeakable for a number of reasons. Primarily because it is a living thing that doesn't bear speaking so much as it bears being, okay? Secondly, the Hebrew word itself, yod he vav he has no vowel points. It's a Yod, a He, a Vav, and a He all put together, but it never has vowel points. It was not given vowel points in the Torah. That means that it is literally unpronounceable. It is the vowel points that make Hebrew letters pronounceable. Any Hebrew word is completely unpronounceable until you insert vowel points. Different vowel points can fit into a word and give the word different pronunciations and different meanings depending on the vowel points. So, yod he vav he does not come with any vowel points. So, it cannot be uttered. So, since it cannot be uttered and it's in scripture and scripture must be read, right? The uh, In Judaism, the word adonai is substituted every time 
yod he vav he is printed in the text. Okay, so the the person who is speaking the Torah verses will say Adonai instead of yod he vav he. Now Adonai means Lord. This is where we get the Lord in you know English translations of the Bible. It's for either yod he vav he or for the word Adonai, which is also separately used in the Torah. Not referring to yod he vav he so this is a little different. Now, <clears throat> yod he vav he is also translated into English as Yahweh or Jehovah. <clears throat> Yeah, those are pretty much the only two. Uh, sometimes Yeheshua, but this is, you know, a bastardization of the word. Anyway, <clears throat> so <clears throat> the Yod He Vav He is a magical operation, really, especially from our perspective. We have the Yod Hokma, the He Bina the Vav Tiferet, and the final He is Malkuth. And this is a movement of awareness through the levels of awareness, okay? Bringing it from the highest point, Kether, all the way down to Malkuth. And we're doing that internally with TMO. This is the point of TMO is this movement of awareness and the opening of that channel of awareness from Kether, the Ani, all the way down to the final He and the Adonai. Now, Adonai is different from yod He vav He technically as a manifestation of yod He vav He and that's what we're doing in TMO. We are using the yod he vav he to create this descent and this channel of awareness. And when we do, the Adonai light erupts. This is the result of yod he vav he, is the Adonai. Now there is, in Kabbalah, not in the Torah, but in Kabbalah, there is a combining of yod he vav he, those four letters, the yod, the he, the vav, and the he, and Adonai, which is also four letters, aleph, daleth, nun, yod, okay? There is a way of combining these two words and the vowel points from Adonai and making a word, which is roughly Yadonai, okay? Um, and this has a specific magical Kabbalistic meaning. It is the yod he vav he of TMO combined with the Adonai. This results in the Catholic brilliance. This is where TMO takes you eventually, is the generation of Catholic brilliance, okay? Which is a product, a process of uniting the yod he vav he and the Adonai, okay? <clears throat> okay. Question number eight. <clears throat> Why does God allow all this terrible torture that humans do to others? For example, look, to, look at all the animal exploitation, which is so heartbreaking for me that I could only cry. Why doesn't he, she, it prevent such a man, unimaginable pain and indignity? I know and understand everything needs its opposite pole in order to exist. But my heart cannot understand this and does not want to accept this. Okay. 
Whoa. <clears throat> Let me unpick this. Number one. I don't do the God thing. I, yeah. To me, this is not cosmology. That is superstition. The idea that there is an omnipotent, you know, great man, woman thing with the great white beard, you know, sitting on the throne, judging and causing and watching over everything that happens. That just doesn't do it for me. So, take God out of the question. Or as I would say, sorry, there is no God. Um, God is a way for us to shirk responsibility for all the shit we've done. You know, all the um, <clears throat> terrible torture that humans do to others. That's human. The only place that that kind of evil, true evil, exists is in the human heart. This is our responsibility. We can't give it over to someone else. Oh, God made me do it. Oh, the devil made me do it. No, <laughs> that doesn't work in the universe. That just creates negative karma, which is sort of like where we're at right now. <clears throat> okay, facing a shitload of negative karma right now. So let's not blame it on someone else. That's all us. We are the ones who allow that to happen. <clears throat> So ask yourself, why do you allow this to happen? Okay? Question number nine. I'm kind of starting to question something that you said in this video a bit. You say that every individual self is unique. But what about things that appear on the outside to be identical? For instance, two completely identical red balls or two completely identical boxes of cat, ladder, cat litter manufactured by the same company. I would honestly assume that they are unique but appear to be the same on the outside. My question, in, my question is, then does the same thing apply for all of us? Somewhere in this infinite universe, there are other individual selves that look very similar, if not exactly like us, but yet still different from us. For example, two identical twins. Um, yeah, everything is unique. There is something about everything that makes it unique just the two identical red balls that were manufactured in the same company, you know, one second right after he, the next, there is going to be molecules inside of them in a different arrangement than the molecules inside of the next. For example, in identical twins, you know, it, it was thought that the identical twins would, twins would have identical DNA. And in early DNA tests, they were in, it was impossible to distinguish between identical twins. But the more powerful the DNA tests became, the more accurate they became, they began to realize that no, there are differences in the DNA between even identical twins. Everything is different. Everything is unique. That's the thing. There are no two things that are completely, absolutely identical in the universe. In the whole universe, there is nothing 
exactly like you other <laughs> than you, period. Things might look similar, but if you look closely and carefully enough, you will see that there are differences. If nothing else, this red ball is in a different place, a different time space than this red ball. Literally, it's in a different time and space. It has a different perspective on the universe. It has a different experience of the universe. It's one billionth of a degree cooler over here than it is over here. Okay? Everything is different and unique. Okay, question number 10, finally. Boy, the magical box has been rough on me today. Okay, question number 10. I would like to ask you if you would recommend focusing on KTQ first and then the Book of Aries or studying them simultaneously or if you would suggest focusing purely on the Book of Aries. Additionally, I would like to ask what the differences are between them in terms of the advantages and disadvantages of one compared to the other in direct practice. Well, I really don't have a recommendation for you because they are two entirely different things. KTQ is about uttering the Kabbalistic letters, the Hebrew letters, of the, the letters of the Hebrew alphabet, basically. The book of Aries is about essential meaning in its raw form, okay? So they're two totally different things. They're not incompatible, but not particularly compatible. Um, in terms of... <clears throat> what the difference, advantages and disadvantages of one compared to the other, they, it's apples and oranges. They are two completely different things, two completely different approaches. Okay? I suggest that you study them both and get to, you know, understand what each is about and then decide for yourself which you prefer, which you want to um, deal with, all right? Oh, boy. Okay, so, that's it today. Oh, the magic box is a lot emptier than it was when we started. So, as usual, if you have questions, put them in the comments section down below, and I'll get to them eventually. And hopefully next time the uh, box will be a little easier on me and won't ask me to answer like 20 questions or something like that. Okay, till then, bye-bye.